Thanks to the recent revelations about political and media figures, sexual harassment has been getting more attention, but harassment has long been recognized, if less prominently, as a problem for low-wage employees, especially immigrants. And the problem became more visible this week in the case of a former employee who filed a harassment complaint against a restaurant in Boston's Seaport District. To tell us about the case is a staff attorney from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice, Laura Maslow Armand. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. All right. Thank you. First of all, tell us about where this case stands, because this has been handled so far by the Mass Commission Against Discrimination, yes. and they have made a ruling, I guess, more or less in favor of the former employee. Definitely in favor, finding a hostile work environment at Strega Waterfront and awarding $20,000 in damages to the complainant and ordering remedial relief, that's to say training and a, a real handbook and an officer of to be uh, appointed who would enforce sexual harassment, anti-sexual harassment policy. So the case is now on appeal to the full commission. We don't know how long that would take. There's some backlog, but it could be a year or so. And that's the mass commission that will decide whether uh, the conclusions of the hearing officer are based on uh, good evidence. Well, you know, th there are some particulars in, in this complaint that I think a lot of people would recognize, almost to the point of uh, first thinking they're commonplace. But more than the particulars, uh, talk about what harassment does to someone's life. Good question. And that, I think, depends particularly on uh, a case such as this one, where the uh, victim is vulnerable vulnerable in many ways, and also doesn't have much choice. Uh, the young woman in our case, 25-year-old woman, Latina, had been working at that restaurant since October. And uh, the comments started pretty quickly. And there was the clear understanding that the direct supervisor, Salvatore Furicado, has the power, as he said himself, to hire and fire. So you're stuck. You leave, and it's hard to find another job. Or you stay, and you endure. So she complained. She complained to uh, her brother-in-law, who is a manager there, and, and actually a chef. And the remarks were of a nature to laugh off her complaints and to say, well, that's Salvatore, that's what he does, that's his way. You know, he's the boss, put up with it, is basically the message she was given. So uh, she was very upset about this, and, and she would come home and, and, and tell what had happened to her boyfriend, now husband, and he said, I want you to quit. He, you know, didn't like this position that she was in where the supervisor was saying to her, you know, are your breasts real? Are you a virgin? I want to be your first. Yes, sir, to massage him, too, allegedly. And that's right. Yeah. He's, he's, and, and he had other women comply and give him a massage. So she refused. Our, our client refused. So the husband wanted her to quit. She didn't. That creates a certain tension at home. And uh, the lack of choice is wearing on someone. And then um, she, she started working in October. And then in February, uh, towards the end of the month of February of 2014, she was summarily fired under an accusation of theft that is such an evident pretext. She was fired for, she was accused of stealing a social security card that was very soon found in the purse of another worker. So that added to the, you know, sort of constant refrain of sexual comments and invitation, can we go to the casino, I'd like to go out with you, that is wearing. And I think the effect of it came particularly when she left the restaurant, when now she's being accused of being a thief and, and she had to put up with the humiliating treatment. And I, I think the emotional distress built up as she, in, in the months right after, and she then became, she was also pregnant, and, and this was very hard on her.
Another uh, factor here is the term that I think the uh, Commission Against Discrimination used. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it hostile work environment? Yes. What does that mean exactly? Well, I, I, it's, you, your, your question is good. And the means exactly is a problem, I think, that we all confront in these sexual harassment cases where you have a number of terms. You have two types, essentially. This is part of employment discrimination, and it's in the workplace. You have hostile work environment or quid pro quo sexual harassment, where you're obviously, as in the casting couch, in order to get the job or to keep the job, you have to comply with the requests for sexual favors. But I think the, the, the border between the two is very hard to define because there's always a power play. It's a supervisor against a... She was a dessert line worker. She's really at the bottom of the chain. And the direct supervisor, who is a vice president of the company, the Verano Group, has the power, and she knows he has the power, to reduce her hours, give her an unfavorable shift. So it's always, I think, related to a quid pro quo. But uh, the hostile work environment means that the environment, the workplace, is pervaded with um, sexual comments. And those sexual comments have to be seen by a fact finder as severe or pervasive. And also, as part of the test, and again, hard, no bright line here, they have to be subjectively and objectively offensive. Subjectively offensive and unwelcome to the complainant, but maybe not to another person in the, in the workplace, because those same remarks and invitations were given to another worker, a co-worker of our client, who didn't seem to mind. So the subjectively offensive, and then objectively, somebody in the shoes of a person in her position would have to also find them offensive. So all those tests are a little complicated, but the commission found that the workplace at Strega was pervaded with these kinds of sexual innuendo and complaints and remarks and uh, humiliating treatment. This has been a news, and we're talking with Laura Maslow Harman from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. Um, or I, I imagine another thing that might be pretty common with harassment is that it happens between two people when nobody else is around or within earshot. So, how do you prove this? That's really a good question, Chris, too, because it's almost never in front of anyone else. But in our case, in fact, we had a witness. And I, this is one of the one of the issues that might come up before the full commission. We had a witness who worked there at the same time who was herself harassed, and she provided a sworn statement detailing what had happened to her and what she witnessed was happening to our client, Levina Hernandez. But when it came to the public hearing, which is in the administrative agency at the MCAD, and it's in a room, an informal room. But there's no way to really persuade the world outside that it's not court. And there's no language that we could use to define to her. You're not actually coming to court. She didn't want to show up. And so the affidavit was excluded from evidence. But there is that evidence uh, attached to the amended complaint. And I think that that led the commission to find the first defining step in a, in a case, an employment case, which is probable cause. So the commission said it was more likely than not that uh, Strega Restaurant and, and Salvatore Fioricano had violated the anti-discrimination law. And I think a lot of that favorable finding was based on the fact that we had a witness. Of course, in a better world, uh, if, an, if an employee is harassed, uh, they should be able to uh, elevate their concerns within the company, and there should be a policy. Uh, the people who, who own this restaurant, they say they take harassment very seriously, and they have a policy of some kind. They didn't have a clear policy at the time. And one of the aspects of these sexual harassment cases 
slightly different in Massachusetts law and federal law, but essentially a direct supervisor, a manager, harasses an employee, the company is liable, strictly liable. In federal law, that would be the case if only if there was an adverse action, if the person had been fired or demoted, or, or if the victim had not taken advantage of some readily available complaint system. Uh, our client did complain, did complain to management, but it was laughed off. And there wasn't the kind of uh, hotline, impersonal, that would allow you at Strega to reach higher management and to let your concerns be known. Another factor here uh, in this particular case uh, with Lavina Hernandez, she's an immigrant from El Salvador. Uh, your, 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 your organization is representing some other immigrants who've encountered harassment. Um, what about what immigrants are exposed to? I mean, and that could also, I suppose, depend on their legal status. The MCAD, and I would urge others who like our client, are victims of sexual harassment. And we have had a recent report in The Globe that something like one out of three of restaurant workers, low-wage workers, in, in the food industry are harassed, are sexually harassed in the workplace. So I would urge them to go to the commission and, and file a complaint, which, as Lavina did, did on her own. And she d was able to find an attorney, which she found through a workers' group in Chelsea, the Chelsea Collaborative. And she was then connected to our organization. And f the, f the decision of the commission is three and a half years after she files her case. And all the attorneys are pro bono. We are pro bono. And the law firm that has joined us and brought the case to trial, Wilmer Hale, was pro bono. So the immigration issue, the commission has clearly excluded any testimony related to immigration status, social security numbers, cards, filings, tax filings from these cases, and has done so not only in this case, but in a prior case that we brought, where the respondent wants to compel testimony. What did you show the employer when you were hired? And all those questions excluded by the MCAD. Well, as you can imagine, uh, I think immigrants across the board m might be reluctant to come forward in a way that other people wouldn't. But if, if they do have concerns about their status, is, is there any kind of protection that we can afford them uh, by, by law in this country? We had another uh, sexual harassment case, not in a restaurant, but in a cleaning uh, company. Another source, by the way, where often uh, office cleaners are alone with a foreman in, in an office at night. We had another case like that that has just settled. And in order to protect the complainant, we made it, we filed it as a, jo a, a Jane Doe case. And the commission has a procedure and recognized a, a procedure for allowing a complainant to come forward anonymously and keep that name out of public record. Of course, I'm also thinking of cases, maybe this is more about uh, criminal charges as opposed to administrative proceedings, where uh, I guess an immigrant with concerns about status can get at least a temporary kind of legal status to go ahead with that? A U visa, for example? That's the, uh, that's actually the positive side of these kinds of issues like domestic violence and other kinds of violence that take place in the United States is that, particularly for, as you said, for criminal cases, but also for a civil case like this, if it can be certified by the agency, as the EEOC does, and the Department of Labor and the police departments do, that would allow an immigrant without status to petition for a U visa, which would put them on the road to eventually to citizenship. Well, one other thing, finally, I want to ask about uh, the case of Luvina Hernandez was why she decided to come forward more publicly. Uh, I mean, that would seem to be something people wouldn't want to do, maybe. I admire her courage on this. She not only was willing to come forward, she was willing to have her full name used, and her age, tell the story. She might have been willing, really, from the very beginning, that she never, ever refused to proceed with the case 
to go to public hearings. She never said, I, I want to stop. That's three and a half years and frequent uh, appearances. So uh, she, I, she, she was motivated, she said, also by the publicity very recently at the Lawyers Committee of another case of five restaurant workers who came forward, and that was widely seen on television and on, particularly on the Spanish, CNN Español and, and other Spanish uh, media outlets, and that encouraged her to say, I'm going to tell my story as well. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. From the Warriors Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice, Laura Maslow Armand.